Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 14. And the he that's being spoken of here is Jesus, and this is what it says. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from edema. And Jesus responded and said to the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could offer no reply to this. Now he began telling them a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, Whenever you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And the one who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person and then in disgrace you will proceed to occupy the last place. But whoever, but whenever you are invited, go and take the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are dining at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now also, he went on to say to the one who had invited him, Whenever you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your relatives, nor wealthy neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you to a meal in return, and that will be your repayment. But whenever you give a banquet, invite people who are poor who have disabilities, who are limping, and people who are blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, it's yours. Give space enough that we might hear your voice, space enough that we might know your touch, space enough that we might respond, because this day is yours. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, it's funny what you remember. A lot of years ago when I was associate pastor here, one of the people I remember very, very fondly was Mary Cherry. She would come into the church fairly often during the week just to see what needed to be done, help out however she could. Well, one day she came in and she, <laughs> she had gathered a group around her. She was telling a story that had happened earlier that day. She said her she and her husband Sam were in the car. They were at a stoplight and Sam was driving and, and he was second in line at the stoplight. Well, he let his foot slip off the, the brake pedal and he drifted into the car in front of him. She said he just, just barely tapped the guy's bumper and the guy got out and was furious. Said, started screaming at Sam through the window and just calling him everything but a child of God. And that's when Mary said she noticed on the man's bumper there was one of those Christian fish there on his bumper and 
Mary said, she leaned across Sam through the window and said, excuse me, excuse me, I hate to interrupt. I know you're talking right now, but I see that fish on your bumper. What does that mean? <laughs> I said, well, Mary, what happened? She said, well, he got back in his car, ran the red light and kept on going. <laughs> the right word at the right time. Oh, it's a, it's a precious thing. The right word at the right time. And here Jesus is giving the right word at the right time. The time, it's the Sabbath day. The time, it's a dinner. The place, it's a, at, it, it tells us right here the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Well, that word leader right there, it means he was on the Sanhedrin. That means he wasn't just a leader of his, his, his community or a leader of his block or a leader of his town. A leader on the Sanhedrin was a leader in the world. There were only 120 men that were on the Sanhedrin and they adjudicated Judaism for all the world. That a lot of people knew the commandment, keep the Sabbath day holy. But it was the Sanhedrin that, that, that wrote up the, the rules. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that you don't do work on the Sabbath. Okay, well, write that down. So you don't do work on the Sabbath. But what is work? Well, work is when you carry something heavier than a fig. Okay, well, that, write that down. Make, write that rule down. And so they would write down the, the, the rule. You can't carry something. But what if... Your job is not carrying things. What if your job is a tailor? And your instrument, your tool of your trade is a needle. It weighs less than a fig. If you're a tailor, can you carry around a needle? No, that's called work if you're a tailor. So write that down, right? That's one of the rules that go along with keeping the Sabbath day holy. Well, what if you're a tailor and you happen to have the needle and it's, it's, it's stuck in your robe? Because, you, you, you know, you put it there so you can quickly pull it out if something needs to be hemmed or to be, well, that's work. Whether you know it or not, that's work. 270 of these rules to go along with the one law, keep the Sabbath day holy. And the members of the San, Sanhedrin, they knew all 270 of the rules to go along with that one law. This was one of those type of leaders where, where you saw it, wherever he was, people would point and whisper, that, that, he's on the Sanhedrin. He's on the Sanhedrin. He's one of the 120 most important people anywhere around here. Well, he invited Jesus to dinner. And here Jesus is eating with him. There's one thing that we know about Jesus, and that is he never turned down a dinner. Whether it was the home of, or of the sinner's the tax gatherers, the poor, or the most famous among them, the one thing we know is that he never turned down a dinner. The second thing we know about Jesus, he never turned down an opportunity to heal someone. And across the table from him, it tells us there was a man suffering from edema. Edema is swelling all over his body. And it wasn't just a little swell. He was suffering from it. And so Jesus reached out to him and says he took hold of him and he healed him and sent him home. And he turns to those around him. Is this lawful to do this on the Sabbath? I mean, you, he, he was sitting among the, the, the lawyers and the Pharisees. You, you know what's lawful? You know all 270 of the rules. Is this lawful? Well, they didn't say a thing. And then he turns to them and he says, well, which one of you? has a son or an ox to fall in a well on the Sabbath and, and you don't pull them out immediately. You don't wait and see, well, is this something lawful? No, if it's un there's nothing more valuable than a child. You, you know that when the child falls into a well, you'll risk limb or whatever it takes. You'll get that child out immediately. You won't wait until the next day. Now, an ox... That's not as valuable as a child. And when an ox falls into the well, you really do risk life and limb. There are 20 verses in the Old Testament that talks about what to do when your ox gores someone. 
You get into a well with an ox, the chance is pretty good. You are risking life and limb. You'll be gored, you'll be stepped on, you'll be crushed, you'll be broken in some way. But on the Sabbath day, you'll do it. You'll do it. Well, Jesus here isn't talking about children and animals. It's an invitation to risk. It's an invitation to reach out. It's an invitation to stick your neck out, to go into the well, to risk, to risk. That was the occasion, but they still don't get it. So Jesus offers the right word at the right time. He tells them a parable. It's a parable about a wedding feast. Yeah, imagine for a minute, you're at a wedding feast. And you go in, you look around, you go, well, you know, I, I know the bride about as well as anybody does. I, you know, she, our kids are, are, are friends with each other. She used to come over birthday parties. My daughter would go over to her house. I can't see anybody that knows the family any better than I do. So, so you sit down at the table. And that's when the father of the bride comes up and says, you remember Uncle Charlie and, and Aunt Martha? Yeah, yeah. Charlene was named after Uncle Charlie, and, and you're sitting in his place. I'm sure you can find another place. There's one back there somewhere, and, and it's the kids' table. You can't even see it from there. It's around the corner and behind the wall. You go back there, and the kids are playing in their food, and they're, they're sucking up jello as fast as they can, and there you are. Well, people are kind of snickering at you, going back there to sit at the kids' table. Oh, oh can you imagine anything more humiliating? And Jesus goes on to say, and given the, the right word at the right time, start off at the kids' table. Start off where they're playing with their food and they're trying to suck up their jello as fast as they can. Start off there. And then when you're recognized by the father of the bride to come on up, then you'll be honored. The only thing is, <laughs> that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Rarely would that ever happen. But he's not talking about dinner and seating order. He's talking about risk. Risk. A risk to, to go to that place where nobody else wants to go. The risk. The risk of sticking your neck out, reaching your hand out, going into the well. Risk. Risk. It's something we rarely hear about the Christian life. But if we look at the stories that Jesus told again and again and again and again, Jesus' greatest condemnation were for those who did nothing. The parable of the talents. It's, it's the landowner who gave five bags of gold three bags of gold and one bag of gold. And the harshest words were for the, the one who had the one bag of gold, he did nothing. And he calls him wicked and evil because he did nothing. Think about it. The parable, of the, the fig tree, Jesus cursed the fig tree, not because it produced bad fruit or sour fruit, it produced no fruit, it did nothing. The parable of the Good Samaritan, those who received the greatest condemnation in that parable were the good people, the priest and the Levite who just went by the other way. They didn't inflict harm. They did nothing. They refused to risk. The story of the rich man and, and Lazarus. The rich man didn't do evil to Lazarus. He did nothing and wound up in Hades. And Jesus himself tells a story at the end of time in the separating of sheep and goats. Those who are on his left, the goats, who go to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth is what Jesus says. They go there not because they've done evil. It's because when he was sick, they did nothing. When he was naked, they did nothing. When he was hungry and thirsty, they did nothing. They did not risk. They did not reach their hand out. They did not go into the well. They did nothing. 
Jesus' invitation here is to a risky love. A love that sticks its neck out. A love that reaches its hands out. A, a love that, well, it goes into the well. And it's the kind of love that Jesus has for you and for me. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That Jesus didn't wait till we were good as we could be or even better than we had been. That he gave his life on the cross for you and for me while we were still a long way off. He was willing to risk his life on the cross, his death on the cross for you and for me. Not because it, it made his life so much better and the reward he would get. No, it's because it was what you and I needed. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. That we might have life. A life free from slavery to sin. A life free from slavery to shame. Free from the slavery to guilt. Jesus wiped it all away and he rose from the grave for you and for me. That the power, the power over sin and shame and guilt, over fear and death, would be your power and mine as he lives his life through us. He was willing to give of his life not knowing whether you and I would accept that gift or not. And it's offered, it's offered it, it, his, in a risky love given for you and for me. It's what Jesus calls us to daily. A risky love that st sticks its neck out, that extends its hand, that goes into the well. Max Lucado, in his book, The Angels Are Silent, says, the young husband is packing his wife's belonging. His task solemn, his heart heavy. He never dreamed she would die so young, but the cancer came so sure, so quickly. At the bottom of the drawer, he finds a box, a negligee, unworn, still wrapped in paper. She was always waiting for a special occasion, he says to himself, always waiting. As the boy on the bicycle watches the students taunt, he turns inside. That's his little brother they're laughing at. He knows he should step in and stand up for his brother, but those are his friends doing the teasing. What will they think? And because it matters what they think, he turns and pedals away. As the husband looks in the jewelry case, he rationalizes. Surely she would want the watch, but it's too expensive. She's a practical woman. She'll understand. I'll just get the bracelet today. I'll buy the watch. Someday, someday, the enemy of risky love is a snake whose tongue has mastered the talk of deception. Someday, someday I can take her on the cruise. Someday I will have time to call and chat. Someday the children will understand why I was so busy. But you and I know the truth. Someday never comes. You and I have been living in a hard and difficult time during this pandemic and, and, and the call, the hiss of the serpent throughout this pandemic has been one of fear, of self-preservation. To not stick your neck out, to not reach the hand out, to play it safe. And that someday we'll risk Someday we'll extend the hand. Someday things will be different. Jesus is calling us to more than someday. This day he's calling us to a risky love. A risky love that doesn't just give so we'll get. We like to think, well, you know, you give what you get. But sometimes you don't. And Jesus says, give anyway. We like to think, well, you reap what you sow. Well, sometimes you don't, but we, we sow anyway. 
It's not because of what we'll receive. It's because of who you are. Jesus is the vine and you and I, we're the branches. It's his power, the power of the risen Christ that lives in us to do what we can't do on our own. On our own, we want to play it safe. On our own, we, we're fearful. On our own, we don't want to risk. But Jesus has more for you and me than that. This morning, it may be that, that God's given you a nudge a nudge to make the effort, to place the phone call, to write the letter, to purchase the gift, to extend the hand, to say what hasn't been said. Jesus Christ has power enough for you and for me, that we'll do that today, not someday, but today. And I want to pray with you now. Let's pray. Jesus, may we not wait for someday, but this day, this day to make the effort. This day to make the phone call. This day to write the letter, to extend the hand, to say what needs to be said. We don't have the power on our own, but Lord, you do. And when we receive you into our lives, yes, it's to forgive all that's past. Yes, it's to forgive all that will be. But absolutely, yes, it's that, that you are the vine and we are the branches. And it's, that it's your power that lives in and through us. Give us that power today that we might reach out in a risky love kind of love you have for us we might have for others it's in Christ's name we pray amen thanks again for joining us today Um, just a reminder if you'd like to watch the entire worship service you can do so via live stream at nine o'clock and 11 15 a.m you can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons also if you have any prayer requests we would love to hear about those you can send those in to pray at rumc.com also if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings you can do that online as well and that's at rumc.com slash giving Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.